Gracie Jiu Jitsu rocks. Welcome to the Gracie Jiu Jitsu Rocks podcast, a podcast dedicated to Gracie Jiu Jitsu and all things Gracie, including self defense, competition, anti bullying, women's self defense and empowerment nutrition, and most especially, the people involved in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. This podcast is for the average Joe. It's for anyone who practices, trains, teaches, or just loves to talk about or hear about Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. We'll explore the lives of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu practitioners, how they got involved in the art, and what effect it's had on their lives. So buckle up and enjoy the ride. Welcome to episode 45 of the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu Rocks podcast. As always, I'm your host, Marty Josie, and thanks for listening. Let's start with our Jiu-Jitsu quote, and that is, There is no losing in Jiu-Jitsu. You either win or you learn. And that's from Grandmaster Carlos Gracie Sr. A very cool quote, and I think it would serve us all well, keeping that in mind anytime we're rolling or competing etc. Okay, very excited about my uh, guest today. My guest is Professor Roy Dean, who is a Roy Harris black belt and a very accomplished Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu instructor, world-renowned through his awesome DVDs, and he's a very insightful and interesting person. So very happy to be speaking with him today. I was fortunate to get a, a copy of his new book called Becoming the Black Belt, one Man's Journey, and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So I do uh, speak with him a lot about that in the interview, but just wanted to say a word about it at this point. It's, the book uh, is really good. It has a bit of everything. He discusses relationships that uh, came and went, the dream of starting his own academy, becoming an internationally known instructor, rivalry schools, uh, when it's time to let go of things and situations, etc. He also talks about some of... Uh, some of the people that you may be familiar with that worked with him in the videos, like Brad and TJ, if you have any of his uh, DVDs. Anyway, great book. We'll be getting a lot more into that within the interview. After the interview, don't forget to stay tuned to the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. And now, without further ado, let's talk to Roy. Okay, I'm speaking with Professor Roy Dean. So welcome to the show, Mr. Dean, and is it okay to call you Roy? That certainly is, and I appreciate you having me on, Marty. All right. I got to say thank you very much uh, up front for taking time to do this. I've been an admirer and a fan of yours for quite some time, your your jiu-jitsu and your DVDs and what that's done in the jiu-jitsu community and just the impact that's had. So it's really a privilege and honor to be talking to you. It's my pleasure. So you've had a really interesting martial arts journey, to say the least. So if you would just start, uh, let's start by you just sharing how you got into martial arts. I know you went to Japan early on, and just talk a little bit about that and how that led you to be a live-in student in Monterey. Yes. So I've always had a fascination with martial arts and 
Japanese culture, even to when I was a, a kid. But when I was 16 years old, I was um, in high school in Anchorage, Alaska, and I wanted to get out of Anchorage. I wanted to explore the world and see a little bit more. So I applied to an exchange program, a Rotary Exchange program, and they ended up sending me to Japan. Now, I wasn't, I wasn't that happy about it initially. I was like, I don't speak Japanese, but they thought looking at my grades and they just thought I would be a good fit. So I went there and then once I was there, they encouraged me to study uh, a Japanese art after school. That could be uh, Ikebana, flower arranging. It could have been Kudo, Japanese archery, but I chose Judo and um, I started training in Judo basically six days a week. Um, they treat it very much like um, an American wrestling team, like high school wrestling. Mm -hmm. So I trained um, six days a week. They had a half day of school on Saturday. And then once a month, I would compete on Sunday at a, a Shi'ai or a tournament. And by the time that I came back to the U.S. a year later, um, I had amassed enough tournament wins to receive my Shodan, their first degree black belt in Kodokan Judo. And then I just continued. I I continued training. I, I wanted to keep up that momentum. Um, mm. I did a little judo here in the U.S., but it's not nearly as popular. So I eventually switched over to Aikido. And after a couple of years of doing Aikido, I felt like I wanted to get serious. I wanted to really dedicate myself to um, studying the art and making it combat effective and you know, I wanted to fully invest myself in the process of being a student and learning. So I looked into what they call an Uchideshi program, which is a traditional arrangement. It's a live-in student arrangement. And some teachers offer that in the United States. I also thought about going back to Japan, uh, to Iwama Dojo, uh, to do Aikido over there. But ultimately, having been in Japan before, there are cultural barriers, there are language barriers. Um, you know, I, I thought, I think I can find a, a, a good teacher here in the U.S. that would be able to take me where I wanted to go. And I did. I found a very gifted martial artist named Julio Terribio, who um, had a dojo in Monterey, California. And he not only was an Aikido master, but he had mastered a Japanese jiu-jitsu system called Hakoryu Jiu-Jitsu, and started his own art called Sebukan. And it was a brilliant synthesis of like the, the white lightning um, holds that they have and the wrist locks they have in Hakoryu with the blending and flow of Aikikai Aikido. So it's really a very, very well-rounded um, Japanese jiu-jitsu system. And I ended up uh, studying that under him. And it was really a transformative a uh, year of my life living in that dojo in Monterey, California. Uh, I can imagine. Uh, I have great admiration for you because, you know, for anybody to take that step and decide to live in a training hall and that's going to be your life, you know, your day-to-day -day life, uh, that takes an unbelievable amount of dedication. And not that many people have that, so that's awesome. I want to say that I actually lived in Japan for a little while too, years mm. ago. And it was right around the time that... Uh, Steven Seagal had come out when I came on the scene. So, of right. course, I wanted to do Aikido at the time. So, I, uh, interesting enough, enough, I was in Monterey, California for a while right, be right before that and then went over to, uh, to Japan. And I had a really tough time finding that art where I was. Uh, I seemed to find everything else and then finally found a dojo that taught that, but it was about a month before I was leaving. So, I ended up oh. watching some but never got into it. But anyway, it was interesting, uh, certainly interesting being over there in different different culture, like you said. But Yeah, absolutely. Back to that, uh, absolutely. You know, I mean, and, you know, as an American, you know, martial arts fan, you might think that, um, you know, martial arts are everywhere in Japan and everyone's doing judo or aikido, but it's not really that way. Judo is more confined to, you know, high school. It's an athletic activity. And you know, not everyone is a martial arts master. In fact, most people in Japan are not really interested in martial arts at all. And I think having lived over there, it helps pierce that veil of mysticism about Japanese martial arts and Japanese, right. Japanese martial artists. 
Absolutely. Completely agree. And uh, going back to your living in Monterey, uh, you go into great detail of that about that experience in your book called The Marshall Apprentice, right? Correct. Okay. Just wanted to make sure that's there. And that leads us to your latest project, which uh, is your new book, and it's called Becoming the Black Belt, One Man's Journey in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So I was fortunate enough to have a an advanced copy of this and get to read it, and I was just blown away. I love this book. I uh, can't say enough about it and just wanted – well, I want everybody to uh, to know just what an incredible book this is, and it was very interesting. It was great learning about your journey, the things that happened to you, Roy, and how they impacted you, mm-hmm. your struggles, your successes, and you really open up in this book and let the reader kind of into your world. That had to take a, a lot of courage. So what led you to writing this, and what was that process like for you? Mm, good question. The The, the process was not actually as quick as I imagined it would be. I wanted to do a follow-up book on, you know, that journey, basically the martial apprentices, my journey in Japanese jiu-jitsu. And then I had quite a saga, um, you know, coming up doing competitions in Southern California, um, finding my teacher, uh, Mr. Roy Harris, um, you know, just using competition as a rite of passage, um, launching my own academy, just all these different trials and tribulations that you go to, uh, you know, you grew to great lengths to be able to really understand and know this art we call Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, it's, I consider it a high art. It requires a lot in terms of physicality, in terms of uh, strategy, in terms of dedication. It's not a one-year martial art. So, you know, often there can be an image of somebody you see online, um, you know, and I think that very often what people post online is just the highlights, just a very edited version of um, what that person's actually like. And I think mm. making yourself vulnerable makes it real. And People think like the gold medal is the inspiring thing. Yes, it is. But also knowing that person has been through loss or heartbreak or injury and has managed to come back and overcome. I think that those are really the inspirational nuggets that people can latch onto and refer to. And so I think that being vulnerable in this book was an important process for me, um, you know, to keep it real. It's not just, you don't just arrive with a black belt in a super smooth game. You know, it takes a long time. You got to pay your dues and you really didn't never stop paying your dues. So being able to share that with people, um, a lot of people over the years have reached out to me and told me that they found my, my media, whether it's DVDs or just videos online, they found it really inspiring. And, um, anyways, I think that expressing a little bit of vulnerability um, just helps bridge that divide between me and them. So if they're going mm-hmm. through some struggles, um, you know, you can make it to the other side and be able to contribute something that inspires somebody else so you can really pay it forward. Uh, I completely agree. I think showing your vulnerability makes you real. And people relate to real people and struggles and conflict and success, but all of it. Uh, if you see someone you know nothing about them besides they want a gold medal. Uh, that, that inspires you to some level, but so much more with the depth of, the, of your whole story and, and everything you've gone through, that, that reaches people on a far deeper level. So, awesome. Uh, one thing I was surprised in reading the book is that uh, you got to know Rob Wolf when you were up in Oregon, and I'm also an admirer of his work. Um, great. For those who aren't familiar with him, he, he was one of the forerunners of the uh, paleo or primal movement and wrote a book, The Paleo Solution, which is really mm-hmm. great. Um, and I used to listen to his podcast a lot. So it was kind of cool seeing that you guys had crossed paths as well. You know, and and that's the interesting thing. Uh, one, Rob is a great guy. We, we go back, we were introduced by a mutual friend. Uh, they attended the first CrossFit certification together. You know, all these overlaps, whether it's, um, you know, people coming up in a certain realm or whether that's, you know, he is into um, biochemistry and I'm into martial arts and media or whatever, but we all kind of 
find our way and then, you know, rise up, go to that next level. You know, he was writing his book and then he published his book and we were working together on P menu, which was kind of a, an offshoot of um, the CrossFit journal while I was working on a project called the um, E journal of jujitsu, um, which was a, a failed project, but you know, I learned some valuable lessons and, and so, you know, being able to, to look back, maybe read my story, relate to, Oh, that's a leader in that community or, Oh, CrossFit was very small back then, you know, and CrossFit has morphed into something several times removed from what it originally was, but it doesn't mean it's good or bad. It's just, it, it continues to evolve just like jujitsu, just like any right. of these things of study. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I want to talk more about the book in a few minutes, but for now let's um, change gears a little bit. And sure. uh, I want to ask you about your time with, uh, with Sensei Roy Harris. And I know he's been somewhat of a father figure and mentor to you. And so just tell us a little bit about what that relationship, how that started and what that relationship has been like for you over the years. You know, I had heard of Professor Harris from Garth Taylor, who was Claudio Francis's right-hand man and top American student. He recommended him. I said, hey, who do you think I should train with in San Diego? He said, you have a lot of good options. Claudio Santos is down there. He listed off some names and he said, you know, Roy Harris, very intellectual approach from his JKD background. You might be interested in him. So, you know, I hadn't decided what I wanted to do or who I wanted to train with down in San Diego, but um, I ended up having a long conversation with a gentleman named Michael Jen, and uh, who is a um, black belt under Joe Marrera and a former training partner of uh, Mr. Harris's. So he said, look, Mr. Harris can, he can do what you want. You want to get your black belt. He can outline a clear path to each belt. I was a blue belt at the time. And, you know, for somebody in that, at that time to be able to give me specifics about what I needed to work on, not just show up and train harder, but actually give me concrete suggestions on what I needed to do, what kind of physical skills I needed to improve and what holes I needed to fill. That was, that's what I wanted. So um, I ended up checking him out. His guys were very loyal. They had great things to say. And I ended up uh, training under him. Um, it originally was a very kind of like, oh, that guy's teaching me jujitsu. It wasn't really, you know, he was just a, a teacher. And it wasn't that close. But over the years, my very good friend, Brad Hirakawa, he was my training partner. Um, we were kind of like adopted sons to Mr. Harris. And we helped him out. We realized this is a good man. This is not your normal guy who's just dialing it in. He was very, very interested in our progress. He wanted to see us succeed. He is a giver. And, um, and I'll never forget, you know, we were kind of, you know, I had gotten my purple belt, Brad had gotten his purple belt. Um, we were both wrapped up in the working world and girlfriends and whatever. And we weren't putting that much time on the mat. And he sent us an email that, we both printed out. We both, he told us to tape it on our mirror, tape it on our computer, look at it every day. And it listed concrete steps to get our brown belts. <laughs> and, and we did, he made it achievable and he didn't give up on us when he could tell when we were kind of, we were starting to drift away and he brought us back in. And my life is remarkably different for that kind of care and attention that he gave us mm. at that time. Wow, what a great opportunity to have learned so much and be a part of uh, such a great man's life. Yes. You know, one of my favorite uh, BJJ videos is his uh, BJJ Over 40. I just I love that. Uh, it's a really good, insightful video for sure. Uh, definitely. And, you know, and there, therein lies his dilemma. In a way, he's a man ahead of his time. He was doing the BJJ Over 40 thing long before anybody else kind of got into that. And he was into leg right. locks long before people were into it, back when it was like, it wasn't just dirty, it was basically forbidden. And, <laughs> and of course, now with John Danaher and the success of his students with the heel hook and the leg lock game, and he has his own system, and we're seeing a re-emergence of that. It's like, oh, never been better. But believe me, Mr. Harris was 
he has a very keen mind for assessing the strengths and weaknesses of an art. And he immediately saw that, you know, if he had to design a system to beat Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, it would heavily revolve around leg locks. You know, you go to the unguarded mm. gate. And um, so he definitely was ahead of his time, technically and tactically, um, in his choice of uh, submissions. Right. I love that, that you go to the unguarded gate. That's that's great. Yeah, he has uh, definitely been ahead of his time. And I was uh, I just found out from your book that he I knew he did JKD, but I didn't know he was uh, vice president of the uh, PFS Progressive Fighting System for Paul Vunak for some time. I actually studied some of that as well. So that's, that's pretty cool. Oh yeah, yeah. He was he was heavily involved with uh, Mr. Vunak, uh, and um, I believe he does. His JKD training with uh, he still goes and will train with uh, Dan Inosanto, um, and um, she will uh, sometimes they exchange information. He'll give Mr. Inosanto a private lesson, and Mr. Inosanto nice. will share his cornucopia of knowledge with him. Awesome. Well, one thing that I uh, I do admire about you, Roy, is that you know you, you hear the term martial art and. Most people get the martial part, but not not everybody really gets the art part. And I think you're different in that way, where you realize you really emphasize the art part of martial arts, and that's very evident in your DVDs. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have a, a few of yours. I have your blue belt uh, techniques, purple belt techniques, and brown belt mm. techniques. Uh, I've been wanting to get the Nogi Essentials for quite some time, but just haven't done it yet. But I will be doing that. But um, those are really great and. What's been your favorite one to do so far, and just how did that whole thing develop? Well, you know, it's it's interesting. I um, years ago, when I was working as an audio engineer for a production company in San Diego, um, I thought to myself, I was kind of, you know, I was learning the craft. I was learning sound design and how to mix audio, and you know, I was I was already hired as an expert in, in that realm. But then with production, you have editing and filming. And so I was kind of absorbing that information in San Diego and then doing my own little experiments where I was putting together, um, you yeah, know, just little highlight videos, jujitsu videos, a uh, YouTube, I think was just launching. And eventually I put together a commercial just to see if I could do it. I got it on the air and I ran like during ultimate fighter down in San Diego. And I thought, Oh, I'm really, I could do this. Wouldn't that be cool if all I did was martial arts videos. <laughs> and that was just, that was just a thought that was just like, wow, wouldn't that be cool? And then over time when I decided, you know, I need to, I need to change my scene. Um, I had kind of, hit the ceiling at my, um, at my job at the, at the production company. And I decided that I was going to launch a present Jiu Jitsu Academy. It would be different than anything, um, than any environment that I had trained. I was going to make it more artistic and really leverage the media end of things. So when I started the Academy, I had the idea of being able to do videos or DVDs, but, um, and I did. I did year one seminars. I had two black belt seminars on it and some other things. And, you know, it did all right. But then blue belt requirements, all I did was solidify Mr. Harris's blue belt requirements by filming them and then tightly editing um, the mm -hmm. techniques that I demonstrated. And also having some straight talk about, look, you're getting into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It's not an easy journey, but I've been there. I've, I've climbed that mountain, and I'm here to bring you up the mountain. And so if you just prepare yourself uh, appropriately and check your expectations and focus on these techniques, I think you'll have an easier time going up the mountain. It was really cool seeing or reading kind of what was going on while you were, were doing these and, you know, the different ones and uh, where you were uh, in your life and what went into it. It's kind of like I always like to see the other perspective, It's kind of like um, – when I watched Hicks and Gracie's documentary Choke, oh, I had seen classic. I had seen that Valley Tudo, you know, when it happened on video, I saw it. But then to see the background story made it just that much more interesting. Well, same with your videos. I have some of the videos, but then to kind of read where you were and what was going on in your life while you were doing it was very very cool. Oh, um, a couple. Yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed that. Absolutely, and, and that's uh, it. Reminds me of the I don't know if 
where I heard this term, but it reminds me of the term um, uh, kinetic poetry, the way you move and the artistic nature of your, your videos. So it's cool. Um, some of your other videos, not DVDs, but just uh, YouTube videos, like the spirals of jujitsu and the ones that are white to black, like arm lock oh, yeah. and kimura, those are just really phenomenal. Uh, and if anybody listening haven't seen, hasn't seen those, check those out. They they take a, an arm lock or a kimura or, or a technique and from the eyes of a white belt and then all the way through as you progress and see things differently and all the way to black, how all that changes, that perspective of that one particular technique. Really cool stuff. You know, that is, I'm so glad you like that. And what I, I really wanted to do was, was do something different, kind of move the medium forward and put the art in the best light possible. So, Sometimes taking those slightly more artistic approaches to, you know, instead of just showing a technique, maybe you use a voiceover so you can cover more ground or maybe give people enough so they can have a conceptual breakthrough. Um, mm -hmm. I think those, those are really satisfying uh, videos to do um, when, I, when I get it right. But now the, the white to black that was something that people said, man, you should do this for every position. But to be honest, I like to do new things. And, you know, I did white to black, the arm lock. I did white to black, the Kimura. I might do another one on the triangle. I might, I might go further with that. But, um, but the obligation of like, okay, now I have to cover every position. That would kind of suck the love right. out of it. And I only want to do videos that I love, you know, I want that yeah. love to be a parent. I don't blame you a bit. You know, and, and, and because if it's, if it becomes workmanlike, then people vibe off of that. They're like, yeah, it's, all right. mm -hmm. it's okay. You know, I want it to, I want to be inspired. So that inspiration is transmitted through the video. Mm, that's great. Great way to put it. If it's not fun for you anymore, inspirational, why do it? Right. Mm-hmm. One thing, I, one of the ones, just before we leave the DVDs and, uh, and video uh -huh. subject is on your purple belt requirements, the first part, the, what makes a purple belt, uh, I just love that. Uh, the way you do the analogy of, of to language and starting with, you know, words and then sentences and then conversations uh, and even arguments, uh, mm -hmm. brilliant. I, oh. I really like that. Oh, thanks, man. Thanks. You know, hey, hopefully it shaves a few steps off for people, you know, that are learning because it, it was, it was very, jujitsu is one of the hardest things I've ever done. You know, as I look back now, um, I understand it and it's so much easier to understand what the art's about and how to learn it and the technical options because we have so many resources. But back in those days, it was just like, people are able to do this. I want to know how. And there was this huge divide between the people that could do it and the people that wanted to know how. And, and hopefully this, you know, every generation needs to make it easier for the next generation. Mm. And so hopefully I contributed to, for, um, for my generation. And I hope the guys that come after me are able to take it to that next level and, and make videos and make educational materials that, um, that just rock that progression and that advancement even faster. Right on. So besides Mr. Harris, who's had the biggest, or who are some of the people that had the biggest impact on your life, Roy? And this could be personal or professional. Um, yeah, I have a lot of, well, Mr. Ha from a martial arts perspective, Mr. Harris and then um, Sensei Julio Terribio, the huge influences, both uh, little bit father figures, um, both really, really good men and stellar martial artists. Um, aside from that, uh, I have I have a good friend named uh, Bob who is very successful, very successful real estate developer, and he is someone who taught me how to be aggressive in life. You know, look. Um, he, he said, he told me early on, you know, look, if you don't ask for it, you're not going to get it. Or you probably won't get it if you don't ask. So ask. And I used to be a little bit more, you know, reticent, just a little bit. I would hang back a little bit more, 
And he taught me how to really, the world is looking for leadership. Take it, do it. And it's so true. It's so true. So he kind of taught me how to get out of my shell and be able to lead people and be aggressive, go for what you want. And fortune favors the bold. And there's, mm-hmm. there's nothing, you know, as long as you intelligently muster your forces and put them in a direction, you will usually succeed. And so Bob's a great guy and uh, taught me a lot about success and being able to go for what you want because you need that and you need to do it on the mat too. And so if you learn how to do it so that you're just clinical and pinpointed in what you want, then you can have success on the mat. You can have success in life and you don't need to worry about running people over or being rude. No, it's just your enlightened self-interest that guides us all. Well said. Well said. All right. I would like to read a few excerpts from your book and just have you kind of uh, expand on those if you would. Sure. So let's start with leave your ego at the door is a popular saying in BJJ circles. What they don't tell you is that you have to lose that ego many times in the journey. Once as a white belt, of course, but again at every rank along the way, even at black. Yeah. I don't know, Martin, what do, you what, think? Are your what, what, do you, what do you What do you think about I think that that's a very, very true thing, and you hear it tossed around a lot, and I think it's probably one of the hardest things to do for a lot of us. I think some days, but for me personally, some days I'm really great at it, and other days it's a struggle. But the more that you have that as a main goal in the forefront of your mind, the better your chance is to have uh, more good days than bad when it comes to that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, there, there's, you know, I mean, there are examples. Let me try to give an example um, at every level. So at white belt, okay. you think, hey, man, I'm tough. I'm skilled. Or, you know, I'm I'm a good athlete. I, I used to row crew or I used to wrestle or whatever. And then you, you have to drop that because it's a different game. You know, you could be the best runner in the world, and that and that does not really help in jujitsu. You know, so right. the physical attributes, all that stuff, that may assist you later. It might even help you right away, but it's not going to be enough. So, and you don't, you know, other people are like racing around a course, and you're still learning the curves and the, you know where to turn, and you're learning the map. So, of course, you you have to lose it at, um, and shouldn't be concerned about tapping either. Although a lot of people are when they're white belt. Blue belt, um, there's a lot of ego wrapped up with what you know. And it's true, going from white belt to blue belt, like if somebody shows you a particular escape or a block or something, you that can mean the difference between surviving comfortably and like just suffering for minutes. So one single piece of knowledge can sometimes make the difference between um, – you know, a really uncomfortable experience and something that really saves you. But you can get trapped in that, well, I know this technique. I saw this on YouTube. Oh, you should do that for that. And in fact, the way you see people instruct on the mat, you know, like blue belts are probably the most chatty of anybody. You walk around on the mat, you know, you're, you're teaching class, the, the blue belt teaching the white belt, they want to show every detail, every insight, every technique, they just want to share it all because they're so right. happy that they know this and it works. And that's kind of like the seed that would make somebody want to be a teacher later. You know, right. um, at purple belt, I think you transform, you go from, you know, a martial artist to a submission artist at, by purple. You can actually tap people and often people that larger than you, you know, you really know how to use combination and momentum. So, at purple, now you got the skill and you have the knowledge and, you know, on a good day, you might be able to beat someone who's, who's better than you are. And then you're like, now your head really starts to swell because you can, you just, you become something else and you're not seeing the difference between say a purple belt and a black belt because your level of awareness is not that refined. 
it takes longer and longer and longer to understand and see and feel the difference. You know, why is that brown belt beating that purple belt? Well, you know, he's just better. It's very nonspecific, you know. Well, it's, it's because his pressure is more directed. It's because he has one more guard pass in his chain where he can go left, right, left, right, left, and then pass the guard. And or he's already mapped out that, that purple belt, you know, two basic responses to that position. So he knows where that person's going to go, where the purple belt might, may still be figuring that out and observing. So, you know, a purple belt, the ego can swell. A brown belt, you can basically tap anyone who walks in a room unless they're you know, an Olympic wrestler or um, another, another really, really skilled martial artist, like Olympic level judoka. And then a black belt, you know, I'm a black belt. But just because you're a black belt doesn't mean you're a black belt in all realms. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean, you know, you know what they say about good athletes? They're, What's that? They're good athletes. <laughs> you know, that, that, that is, is yeah, that is true. That is true. That's so, good. so you know, there's opportunity all along the way. And like I mentioned in the book, I, yeah, I was pretty good when I got my black belt, but, you know, you also feel like a little insecure. Like, oh, man, I have to beat everybody down who walks in the door, mm-hmm. you know, or I need to really show. And, you know, four or five years, you relax. You really get into that, like, uh if you catch me, you've, you're pretty good. In fact, I'm going to steal it. If it's good enough to catch me, I'm I'm taking that. Right. I'm taking that home. Yeah. With me. Absolutely. Why? By the way, just on a side note, when you're talking about from blue to purple, yeah, uh, it's such a big step. Why do you think so many people fall out after on the way from blue to purple and never never make it to purple? Oh. Well, I think part of it is time. Uh, you can get your blue belt if you're really gifted. If you're really gifted, you know, maybe six months. Uh, maybe you have some previous grappling experience or you're a really good martial mm-hmm. artist. Or that could take up to like two years. Or some people even, you know, not like six months or two years. Um, right. And so if you, if you get that, like say it takes you a year, and you're thinking, well, purple, how long can that be? One year, two years? It's possible you could get in maybe an additional two years, but most people take three to five years. And along the way, there are some serious blue belt plateaus mm. where you are, you know, you have your, I experienced this myself. Um, as a blue belt, I had a couple good techniques. I have a really good sleeve choke that I got from my first teacher, Claudio Franza. Um, I had a really good triangle. And I think I had an arm bar or something. It wasn't, but it wasn't awesome. It was not. And that was basically it. I could tap people, but I bored myself with my own game because I just did like the same couple of tricks. And then what do you, what do you do to break out of that rut? You need to train differently. And I think this is when like a very dissatisfied blue belt might like, switch to another school or they are looking at, you know, an inordinate amount of YouTube videos trying to find the secret and, and you know, that struggle on what do I need to do and then doing the work. First you have to find what to do to get better. Then you actually have to do the work for skill development. So those, and you know, once you kind of get your purple belt, you know how to train yourself and you, and I work on stuff for your brown and I work on stuff for your black. But in that, those early formative years, like the first four years, it's, it's not as clear. So, you know, if you're hanging out as a, you get your blue belt after like a year, and then two years later, you're still a blue belt and you're a little bit better, but you're not like, you know, you're still kind of doing the same things. You may not see your own progress. Mm-hmm. And I, I liken it to, you know, uh, like a, a flower coming up through the ground. You keep watering it and watering it, but if you just give up, it will never break the surface and you'll never see it. Mm-hmm. You know, but you, you have to just believe. And that's purple belt. When that, when that sprouts out of the ground, it's become something else. And it takes a lot of faith that you're going to do it and a faith in your instructor. 
and then, you know, faith in your own abilities that you are progressing because as people around you progress, it's difficult to gauge your own, you know, your own progress. So it's, that's why it's better if you just get lost in the journey along the way. Mm. Wow. Great insight. Thank you for that. Another uh, excerpt from your book. Now, here's the truth. You will lose every student that comes to you eventually over time. How gracefully can you let go of things? You have to learn to celebrate the release, but it's easier said than done. And I know you were speaking specifically as an instructor, but yeah, share a little bit more insight on on that and, and just the whole letting go process. Mm, yeah, that was exactly the opposite of how I thought when I first started teaching. Originally, when I started teaching, I, you know, I did a little experiment. I was in San Diego. I asked Mr. Harris's permission to lead a grappling class at this uh, big Aikido school in San Diego. And I did. He granted me permission. I started it on the weekends. It, it started attracting people. And I wasn't even really trying. It just started attracting people from various schools. So I, I definitely said, oh, well, that's good. That's working. And I thought that that same mojo that I had would keep students with me for forever because I was a good teacher. You know, I actually had real skill. Um, I just had my own presentation where uh, the art where I thought people actually progressed a little bit faster um, than many of the other, um, you know, instructional modalities that I had experienced. So I thought, yeah, everyone will stick with you. Uh, but that's not true at all. That's not true at all. Some people will stick with you. Hell and high water, they'll stick with you. You're their teacher. Um, you know, people are going through their own thing and everyone has a struggle or that that they're dealing with. And very often it's about them. It's not about you. So I used to take things just far too personally because I was, very personally invested in teaching the art. Um, And being able to let go of people is something that I wish I knew right away. Of course, you let people go in a professional manner. Um, If it's a student, it's a handshake and a conversation, you know, and you wish them well, wherever they end up, you wish them well. Um, And often, look, if if they want to go, they're already, they're already gone. Don't, don't try to hold on to people. Um, you may think, oh, I'm, I'll be losing money. Don't worry about that. The, the money is in the new students that are walking in the door. It's not in the people that are there right now. You know, but don't try to hold on to people. You need to let people go gracefully. And you know what? They may realize, seeing another teacher, that, oh, actually, his approach was, I think, a lot better. They may not admit mm-hmm. that, but... Later, they might. They might say, you know, I thought I wanted like a really competition heavy oriented school, but I've never been so injured in my life. But it felt good for those couple times that I did it. And, or they may, uh, or you might realize that, you know, the vibe is a little bit better with, without that, that person here. And yet I was struggling to hold on to them. And so basically, everybody that comes in your door. You just want to have a professional rapport with them and guide them as long as they want to stay on the path. And when it's time for them to go, you need to just say, hey, I appreciated your company and I wish you the best. People have a hard time doing that in a professional context. Mm -hmm. And, And as time went on, I got much better at it, much better. And I think that, uh, I think that, you know, and occasionally I will read a social media post about loyalty or this person or somebody's yammering or somebody's, you know, number one, I think that's oversharing. And number two, just accept it now. Accept it right now. And so when it comes, it'll be so much easier. It's coming anyway. Just get used to it. It's true. I think it's uh, professionally and personally, it's hard for a lot of people to come to grips with with letting go. But I think this is really important, and I'm glad you put that 
that that part in your book because I think especially as instructors, anybody who's been in that position, uh, I think it's really hard to not take it personal when someone doesn't keep coming. But like you said, there's so many different reasons that someone may end up their journey may start taking them somewhere else, and that may be to another jujitsu school or may just be off the jujitsu path or whatever. But Absolutely. Getting to the point of saying it's not about me as an instructor, it's it's about their journey, and I'm glad to have been able to be a part of that, but it's not, you know, don't take it as an insult or a failure or whatever it may be. It's it's their journey. Mm. Yes. Well said. Oh, thank you. All right. A couple more. Um, uh-huh. This one is, this art demands a lot from you, physically, technically, emotionally, economically. The demands of jiu-jitsu temper your spirit in a deep, beneficial way, but it can also drain you. Overtraining happens. Having to be there, having to teach, having to represent all the time. There's a price of admission, and I paid it more than once. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Um, <laughs> here's here's the thing. One, jiu-jitsu is, I consider it a high art. You need a high level of physical coordination. Um you need, you know, endurance, strength, isometric strength. Uh, you need, you know, great balance, agility, all these physical characteristics. Then you also need, you know, the economic means to be able to find good instruction. You need to, and often people will go, you know, to, I've had people visit me from all over the place. Um, if, you know, they want a specific kind of instruction, they want a specific kind of teacher, they want to be in a specific kind of environment. Um, people want a specific kind of experience and they want that knowledge. And once you get bitten and you want that power too, or that ability, you will go through great lengths to be able to get it. So, you know, you have to, if you're not that physical, you have to shore up your physicality. Um, you need to be able to, Look, I've been through every kind of physical modality there is, you know. I've been through the power lifting stand. I've done yoga extensively, you know, various kinds. You, you, I even have like, the strength shoe, you know, to get your calves huge and improve, improve mm-hmm. your, your vertical. Oh my God, you know, the, the, the roll up, um, dowel that you use for forearm strength. It, we, oh, I yeah. mean, everything, man. By the time you reach black belt, you've done it all. <laughs> and so you need to you need to do that, and overtraining happens. Why? Because you are obsessed with getting mm-hmm. better, and then you there's something in the back of your mind that says, "Man, well, you know, Jay, I know Jake's a class tonight, and you know, you and Jake are neck and neck, and you need <laughs> to, and yeah, no, you you got to go get your workout in, and then you're gonna have your protein shake, and then you're gonna go to class, and." Look, it, there is something that I was definitely obsessed with, with training, where I felt like other people were getting ahead. And if you even it out over 10, 15 years, that stuff really doesn't matter. And you just need to, you know, take a break now and then, pace yourself. If you need to take a week off of training, it's not a big deal. But in the aspirant's mind, you know, you're, you're buying all the best CDs, subscribe to the best channels, you know, taking private lessons. You got the gym membership, the CrossFit membership. You're doing it all. You want to as quickly as you can. And in the long haul, that stuff evens out. But that overtraining usually happens from an overzealous attitude and a, com- and a mm. competition with yourself where you set right. unrealistically high expectations. Well, I'm, I'm a lawyer. I'm, you know, I'm a very good, high-powered lawyer. I should be great at this. It's like, it's like the lawyer who buys a restaurant because they're a great lawyer and they know how to run a business, but you don't know anything about restaurants. <laughs> That's very true. You know, very true. And, and, that, and that kind of, and there's a humility that needs to, to enter in there. Um, so I think if people were a little bit more gentle with themselves, it, gen, be gentle with yourself in the gentle art. And I think mm-hmm. you'll actually make more gains that way over the long haul. Um, but yeah, the, the price of training and overtraining definitely happens. Um, and yeah. I think that people that are probably white to purple, that's, that's often where they're at. 
by brown belt, you 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 chill. You could take two weeks off, and you still basically use the same game to crush people. And then you start to realize that you're like, wow, my neural pathways are already carved out. And so when you introduce like whatever, like a new technique or a new sophisticated movement, yeah, you're you're kind of going off the main neural track, and maybe you're forging something else. Uh, but if you take a month off, those other light pathways disappear, and you're you're back to the main roads. Right. And Absolutely. over time, you you just realize, man, I'm just going to travel on the main road. What does it matter? <laughs> Right. I don't need every side road there there is, right? Exactly. Do you think that's a good reason that yoga can be so beneficial? Uh, not only just the physical aspect of yoga, but just the the slowing down and centering and and being present, the mindfulness aspect of that that can help make you more of a relaxed, complete person in doing jujitsu. Uh, definitely. Uh, a couple things. Number one, the physicality. Um, that yoga offers you is not in an explosive movement. It's in keeping a soft and flexible spine. So, yeah. you know, I mean, especially if you're doing a lot of guard work, well, you have to be pretty good in jujitsu to definitely maintain top position and be able to kind of like pull your arm, shoulders, put your chest and back into it and to create top pressure. You have to be pretty good to be able to to work that opposite motion from the guard. So to keep that forward back um, symmetry in terms of flexibility, um, the up dog, down dog in, in yoga, I think that's invaluable. Also yoga is symmetrical and most people's games in, in jujitsu are asymmetrical and most sports mm-hmm. are asymmetrical. So I think that physically it keeps you in check. Yoga focuses on breathing, whereas jiu-jitsu really doesn't. I mean, it's part of it, but if you stop breathing, that's when people start getting really tired because they hold mm-hmm. the breath and then they explode and whatever. So it helps expand your lung capacity. It helps you – it kind of unconsciously programs your breathing to be a little more even, a little more full. And then the third thing about yoga is – um, it offers you what they call equanimity of mind. So you're, when you finish, you're in a really even mental state, kind of unperturbable mental state. And that's what you want to have when you're rolling, where if someone's really frantic and amped up and attacking you, you need to do just the opposite. You need to be like, no, relax. I'll even tell myself, just relax, as relax as possible, you know, because you don't want to, you know, fire with fire. You want to be water, you know, mm. or if they're earth, you want to be water. You want to do the opposite element. Right. So, so when it comes to, uh, keeping a, like a cool head on the mat, I think even, uh, yoga will help even you out. And then also the whole not thinking when you're in yoga, if you can get to the point where you're just kind of going through the postures, but really taking your mind out of it. That helps prep you for being on the mat and not thinking, oh, well, I'm going to sweep them and then I'm going to do this guard pass. No. You need to be feeling, instead of trying to do so much, you need to be feeling what that other person's doing, and that will inform you to what the opening is. Nice. Right, so that's a great compliment to it. Do you prefer the heated yoga, yoga or non-heated, or does it matter for you? Um, I think that Bikram yoga, which is, you know, kind of the most popular hot style yoga. of hot yoga. Um, I think it's great in many respects because it's a great introductory course to yoga. You get the yoga high right away um, because they use to heat you internally. But for me personally, it's a little too intense to do as like a, a daily practice or even a multi okay. multi time a week practice so i prefer ashtanga which is in a warm Mm -hmm. room um but not that hot and it's more of doing it at your own pace so i find that to be a little bit i prefer my yoga to be a little bit more meditative 
I agree. And a lot in the age where you can, you can find yoga in every gym as a class, but it, it it seems to favor the move from one pose to another rather quickly. And they try to make it a, more of a workout than anything else. And uh, so much, I get so much more out of the holding the poses longer, the breathing, and making it a lot more restorative and and relaxing than mm-hmm. trying to make it some kind of workout. You know? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, so you also talk about. For you, that it's been more about quality moments rather than tournament victories. And um, there are lineages who primarily see jiu-jitsu as a competitive endeavor. They celebrate the art through matches and gold medals. And then there's the flip side, uh, who view it in, through the lens of self-defense or free fight component. But do you like to take the middle path, the kind of jiu-jitsu that can shift easily to any realm? Talk a little bit about that for us, Roy. So I think the goal for me is to number one, I realized early on that competition is not for everybody. And there is something, um, addictive about the now, like what's working right now and the temporality of, um, you know, who's winning the latest tournament with the latest technique. Oh, we have to learn that it's fashion is what it is. And so and things come in and out of vogue, uh, but I, I have always seen, I came from a classical background. I've always seen BJJ as more of a Budo, uh, a martial mm-hmm. way. So having, having that as my context, I sought to bring Brazilian Jiu Jitsu more into that lifestyle, uh, lifestyle approach, lifestyle component where it's a more holistic approach. Yes, you can compete, and my guys have competed, and girls, and done very well. But I don't push that. I never taught for points. Like, okay, you got to take them down past the guard, and then you're at three points. Like, that never entered into my particular form of instruction. But other people, it's, it's more, they get into it from an athletic perspective. Uh, and that's fine. And traditionally in Brazil, it's, it is much more about, um, you know, it's, it's much more about competition, uh, at, at least some of the lineages that I've, they really, really celebrate that. Sure. And, right. you know, it's verification that their technique is, is great. I mean, it also in competition that's more than physicality. There's a lot of mental toughness. There's a lot of mental toughness, especially in kind of the later rounds in competition. So, I mean, there's so much there and competition keeps the teeth in an art. It ensures that it doesn't kind of go off the deep end where things are unproven and untested. You know? um, but on the other hand, it's not for everybody. So you're going to miss out on showing how powerful this art can be for people that aren't interested in competition. So number one, I want to reach a broader cross section. Uh, number two, you know, sports specific techniques that can be cool in terms of movement patterns, but ultimately I want my students to be able to have like intelligent, leveraged, intuitive movement so that if they get attacked, you know, they don't have a set thing that they're going to do. They're just going to get off the line of attack and do whatever's necessary using their body the best way they see fit. And I think that is, that's really the goal. I mean, to have an educated body, you can have, you can have a million prepared arguments for the world championships and debate, but I just want people to be able to speak and communicate uh, fluently with the people they interact with on a daily basis. I think that benefits your life a lot more than winning a debate championship. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with that and great analogy. Last thing out of your book, uh, and I know we've really talked a lot about your book, but it is such oh, a great book, and it, and it and and it's a good way to get insights into your philosophy. So it all works well together. So you don't have to necessarily respond to this. I just want the listeners to hear this last one, and and that is, jujitsu changes who you are. It gets you comfortable with change and appreciative of variation. Jujitsu allows you to look at people without fear or apprehension. So, awesome, love that. Mm. Mm. I mean, you can expand on that if you'd like, for sure. But well, I, I think it takes away fear. I think it, and that is probably, and then that uh, works very well with the last sentiment, where 
look, you're able to reach a broad cross section of people and to be able to boost their confidence in a real way, in a real earthy, gutted, earned through physical exhaustion and the scientific method, which is trial and error. You know you can do some things on the mat and you had to go through failure to reach success. And being able to just have that physical capability, even if it's only one technique, and to be able to have that real, earned, not intellectual knowledge, like a kind of smug, oh yeah, I, I read a martial arts book and I know this, but you know that you have faced far tougher people on the mat than basically anyone who's going to attack you in the street. Now, mm. I do not want people to, to you know, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is a beautiful art and extremely powerful. It is not the end-all be-all of self-defense. But what, you know, the confidence that you gained, a real-world confidence that allows you to people, uh, allows you to look at people without fear or apprehension, that will take you so far. And to be honest, it's been a long time. I, I'll, I'll talk with, um, I'll talk with different women and different girls that they think very differently than I do. They are always on guard. They are always thinking about when they might be vulnerable to an attack, to, um, to somebody sneaking up on them. That is something that doesn't enter my mind at all. And part of it, I'm like six, three, you know, I'm, jiu-jitsu black belt uh, of course you know those things don't creep into my mind as often but i have forgotten i've stepped away from that mentality and i think that jiu-jitsu is exactly for those people mm -hmm. not to give them a you know a false sense of security but right so that they can leave part of that stress behind uh, and that's huge. I mean, imagine going through life and uh, and a big part of your day, you know, every day is caught up with, with those thoughts of uh, fear and apprehension and uh, anxiety because of that. So if you can take any measure of that away, man, that's that's worth so much, mm. so much for sure. All right. I want to thank you very much, Roy, for taking time and sharing your insights, uh, get, letting us get to know you better. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, before we close, is there anybody you want to uh, shout out to or say thank you to or anything like that? Um, I just want to thank uh, all my friends, uh, all my students, past and present. Um, I entered into, you know, the book was a great way to end that chapter of teaching Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and running an academy professionally. So I I sold my academy in Bend. I spent the last year writing the book, kind of creating that. Um, it's just a nice way to wrap up everything. And I'm down here in Southern California, um, starting a, a new chapter. I have some really cool things on the horizon. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm just grateful. I'm just grateful for the opportunities that I've been given. And I hope to, hope to pay it forward and continue to pay it forward in this art. Awesome. Awesome. Do you, uh, can you share any of the, uh, the things that are on the horizon for you? Well, there, there are two projects that I'm, that I'm, um, devoting myself to, uh, in addition to having a variety of seminars and in uh, about two weeks, I'm going to Norway and I'm planning a trip to, um, I mean, just all over. I'm thinking about going to Italy and Germany this summer and, uh, there's a lot of that, and I hope to actually share those adventures on my new channel. So I'm having a um, a channel that I've been working on. So it's subscription video on demand. Basically, you can get any of my DVDs, any of the bonus material, any of that stuff available anywhere. So you can watch it online. You can watch it on your phone. Um, so I'm working on that at the moment. I just showed my friend and he was like, dude, it looks good. This nice. looks good. Oh. And I'm That's also, exciting. Oh, it, it's cool. And so now I'll have this even, you know, I'll still be showing stuff on YouTube, but the majority of my seminars that I'm filming will go on this channel. Um, my friends, whether I'm interviewing Rob Wolf or Dr. Mark Ang or Mr. Harris or 
any of the other great martial artists that I know, those interviews will go on the channel. So I want to make this more of, I wanted to make it a channel for modern warriors. Mm. Wow. Uh, this, the second project I'm working on is the working title is how to be a BJJ professional. I learned a lot of lessons. Um, I had no idea how to run a business. I had no idea how to run a uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Academy, but I see a need. People want to teach just like the, just like that enthusiastic blue belt who wants to share his technique with mm-hmm. the newer student. People love this art and they want to share it. And I think a lot of people have been inspired by my approach and what I've been able to do. And I, you know, I, the tools that people have on their phone are better than the tools that I started with when I made those DVDs. So I want to share number one, the lessons I learned financially, you know, what worked, what didn't work. Um, and then, you know, how to, just all the, there's like a physical brick and mortar side, lease negotiations, that kind of a thing. But even more importantly was my approach that I feel was, um, was visually demonstrated the, the level of skill that I could take my students to and the crispness of their technique, uh, and what I was able to transmit to those students in those eight years. I think if I can do it, anyone can do it. So I just want to share some of those experiences and how to be a BJJ professional, because, you know, a lot of it is about control, self-control. A lot of it is letting that student go and being a professional. A lot of it is giving of yourself, but never losing your temper on the mat and not taking things personally. And what I wish I knew when I started. So that's the working title. I want to share these lessons Um, and I know that people are out there wanting to share the art and launch this dream of their own. And I want to, just like blue belt requirements, this will be blue belt requirements for instructors. Wow. Very exciting. Uh, You obviously uh, continue to grow and learn and change with the times and to pay it forward in a big way. And you, you've certainly made your impact, Roy, throughout the BJJ community and world. So, again, it's been an honor and privilege to, uh, to take time and talk to you. And I really do appreciate your insights and, and uh, your time. So thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I appreciate the opportunity, Marty. Okay, time for the Make a Difference, Make an Impact segment. Today I'll be playing a clip from a video, a YouTube video called Grow Through Life, featuring Tony Robbins and Les Brown. To feel alive, I have to always feel like we're growing. When people ask me, what does it take to be happy, I always tell them one word, progress. Progress equals happiness. Even if you're not where you want to be yet, if you're on the road, if you're improving, if you're making progress, you're going to love it. You're going to feel alive. On the other hand, it doesn't matter how successful you are. If you stop growing, you start dying inside. If the formula for happiness is to be able to meet your expectations or exceed them, that really makes you excited. But to be happy, you got to at least meet it. It doesn't have to be perfect. But if you generally are meeting what you expect you want from your life in that area, you feel good. Life conditions match blueprint, feel good. What are you doing now? You're still here breathing. That means you've got some more to give. Doesn't matter how old you are, doesn't matter about where you are, doesn't matter about what you have, doesn't matter about what you've done. Life is about growing, it's about being productive, it's about stretching, it's about challenging yourself. So you start looking around and decide, hey, hey, what what else do I want to do? What, What got me here? It's a time for celebration, but also a time for reflection. What got me here? What worked? What did not work? What do I need to do to repeat so that I can get the same kind of results in other areas of my life? If the goal is to improve my health, 
If the goal is to improve my relationship, if the goal is to improve my income, if the goal is to improve something in society, what is it I need to do? None of us do anything by ourselves. Develop an appreciation for external support as well as good fortune because all of those things play a role. What are some of the elements or the characteristics and the qualities of people who are fulfilled, who, who live a life of fulfillment? What are some of the things we can look at about them? Number one, make your mind fertile ground for the seeds of opportunity. Think if you want to experience a sense of fulfillment, you've got to have an open mind so that ideas can come in there and take root and grow. So you want to begin to look at life and have a sense of curiosity. You want to keep learning, keep growing. Realize it never be. You never find out how much you know until you find out how little you know. And that's going to do it for this edition of the show. As always, I thank you for listening. I welcome your feedback. If there's stuff you like about the show, please let us know. Always like hearing that. If you have suggestions for the show, we'd like to hear that as well. So please keep those coming. Special thanks to Professor Roy Dean. And if you're interested in getting his book, you can go on our website and we have a link to Amazon on our products page. You can also, of course, access Amazon in any other way that you would like to as well. We will have Professor Dean's information in the show notes, uh, including his channel for you to check out. If you haven't already done so, go ahead and like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and post a comment or feedback on iTunes as well as rate the show. And you can do that on Stitcher as well. You can also reach us via the website at www.gracyjujitsurocks.com. Again, thanks again for listening, and as always, this is Marty Josie. And until next time, I'll see you on the mat.